Off a day and welcome. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture is now called to order. Today's Friday, November 4, 2022. The time is 10.08 a.m. In compliance with the open government law, notices for this public hearing were published in the Guam Daily Post on Tuesday, October 27, and again on Monday, October 31, as well as the hearing is being live streamed via the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. Notices were also sent via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets. Individuals testifying, I ask that you first uh, be recognized by the chair before speaking and please state your name for record keeping purposes. Thank you. So we only have one agenda item this morning. That's Bill 341-36LS introduced by myself, Therese Terlahi, Sabina Flores Perez, and Tello T. Taitakui. Can we get copies for the senators, please? It is an act to amend Chapter 7 of Division 1, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, and add a new N to Section 9302B1 of Chapter 9 of Division 1, Title 26, Guam Administrative Rules and Regulations, relative to expanding options for assisted living facilities. I'd like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues for attending this morning's hearing, uh, including Senator Tello Taitagui and Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you, colleagues. So as sponsor of the bill, I will begin with the sponsor statement, just a brief introduction of this bill. So bill number 341-36LS amends the current code to expand options for assisted living facilities. As Guam's population ages, there arises a need for new and innovative residential options for our island's Manamco as well as other people who may need assisted living. Guam law allows for nursing homes. However, there remains a large section of the elderly population that is not suited to avail of nursing home services. Many of these Manamco do require assistance and may be suited to other forms of assistive care. One such type of assisted living facility are residential care facilities for the elderly, which provide intermediate care for Manamco who do not require the constant care of a nursing home, but still require day-to-day -day care and assistance. The facilities can address varying levels and intensities of care and supervision, protective supervision, personal care, or health-related services based upon their varying needs. By establishing a regulatory framework for effective establishment, operation, and oversight of multiple types and options of assisted living facilities, the government can regulate quality. And in addition, clients of these facilities may become eligible for Medicaid and other insurance coverage. The bill also adds assisted living to the current MIP list of covered services. Establishing this regulatory framework and coverage will lead to further interest in the investment in assisted living facilities in Guam, which has the potential to not only substantially increase the quality of life for our Manamco, but also may spur valuable economic activity in Guam and additional careers. And we know that we still have challenges in, in um, addressing the needs of our elderly, including nursing, uh, physician providers, and uh, so the bill does not solve every issue, but we're hoping that with expanding the options that we will be able to stimulate this growth. I want to thank uh, Senators Perez and Taitagui for co-sponsoring this legislation, and I want to thank Senator Taitagui, whose recently passed bill, law, allows for QCs for developers of assisted living facilities. And hand in hand, I think these legislations will hopefully spark interest in, in creating more facilities and in these career paths. For the record, so now I'm going to continue with the testimony for the hearing. And for the record, um, invitations were sent to the public, of course, to the media, to the senators, and also to Cornerstone Valuation Guam. Gia Ramos, Guam Board of Nursing Examiners, Department of Public Health and Social Services, Division of Public Welfare, Guam Economic Development Authority, St. Dominic Senior Care Home, 
Kate Kiesling as the Acting Administrator, to the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority, to Dr. Margaret Hattori Uchima, the Dean of UOG School of Health, to the Micronesia Community Development Corporation health and the Health Services of the Pacific. So we'll now begin accepting testimony from those on the panel. Thank you for signing in. Maybe we'll just start on this end with uh, Mr. Carlos Camacho. Oh, okay. All right, so uh, former Senator Fernando Estevez. Thank you, Madam Speaker, honored members. Um, for the record, my name is Fernando Estevez, Deputy Director of the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority. Submitted before the committee here today, um, response and testimony to Bill 341-36. Honored members, Gura does not testify in opposition of support or in opposition or support for Bill 341-36 as currently introduced. Based on our reading of the proposed legislation, Gura does not have a direct role. However, in the execution of our due diligence, Gura offers input on potential opportunities from our federal partner. The U.S. Housing and Urban Renew uh, Development has programs that provide grant opportunities for the aging population that may assist with the intent of the proposed legislation. I offer two forms of assistance under the Assisted Living Conversion Program, or ALCP, Assisted Living Housing and Service Enriched Housing. These programs are situated with HUD and not directly administered by GURA. However, HUD may seek GURA's participation and oversight should an application be approved. As it has never been done on Guam, I can only offer general insight based on our historical partnership with HUD. One example being the recent construction of the iLearn Academy, which was done under Section 108, and that is applied directly with HUD. Um, however, once that application has been accepted, HUD may come back to Gura and ask us to provide assistance uh, with it. But again, these, these programs are not directly with Gura. We have one concern with the legislation as it's currently written. The definitions proposed in the legislation may not be consistent with the project types that HUD can assist with. Should a licensed facility decide to pursue uh, assistance from HUD? HUD considers four categories with the elderly. One, independent living designed to accommodate elderly and people with disabilities who can live independently without the need for assistance with daily living. Two, assisted living facilities designed to accommodate fairly, feral elderly and people with disabilities who can live independently but need assistance with daily living such as assistance with eating, bathing, grooming, dressing, and home management activities. Assisted living facilities must provide supportive services such as personal care, transportation, meals, housekeeping, and laundry. Third, service enriched housing is housing that is designed to accommodate frail elderly persons or elderly persons um, with disability, with service needs who are aging in place. Residents are able to live independently but need assistance with daily activities or with activities or daily living Com comparable to services typically provided in a licensed living facility, such as healthcare related services. These supportive services must be available through a licensed or certified third, par third uh, party service provider. And then fourth, nursing homes designed to accommodate frail elderly persons who are unable to live independently. Gura requests that this committee consider definitions for licensing that can align with funding opportunities. Our concern is that facilities licensed under more, more general terms found in Bill 341-36 LS may not be able to avail of funding opportunities should their license or operations uh, be inconsistent with the parameters of the programs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony submitted with my testimony. And I apologize for the typos. I just typed it up this morning. Um, Exhibit one, which is a uh, HUD reference number 22-177, public release, which is a notification of funding opportunity under section 202. Exhibit two, reference to uh, the funding opportunity 6600-N-52, FY 2022 section 202 supportive housing 
for the elderly program. Exhibit three, program information for supportive housing of the elderly under section 202. And exhibit four, uh, program information for assisted living conversion program, the ALCP. I wanna thank you for that, uh, Senator Stevis. It's, um, and we will definitely take into consideration using these terms and these definitions it was the intent of the bill that we would ca cover the whole um, variations of uh, care that are required and, or assistance that is required and that uh, public health would be able to, to designate those levels and, and the requirements for each. Um, and making them consistent with these programs is exactly what we hope to do. So thank you. Um, I wanna recognize presence of my colleague, Senator Sabina Paris. Thank you, Senator. All right, we'll continue with uh, Kate Kiesling. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker Chalahi. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I wanna thank you for the invitation to speak on this platform. My name is Kate Kiesling, and I am the Acting Administrator at St. Dominic Senior Care Home in Barragata Heights. I am a licensed nursing home administrator from the mainland. I've been working in elder care since 2012 with experience across the continuum, including group homes, memory care, assisted living, skilled nursing, ranging from 12 to 300 residents. I have over 3,000 hours of clinical training for skilled nursing and hold both state and federal licenses under the National Association for Long-Term Care Administrators, specifically for the skilled nursing setting. The field of long-term care is my life passion Guam has four licensed nursing home administrators in its history, and at this time, only two hold active licenses, myself and Sister Teresita, who are both from St. Dominic's. Please refer to page one and two um, to understand levels of care. Um, the language we use to describe levels of care is critical because it identifies the needs of those in the specific care settings. Guam's laws for regulating elder care services is not only outdated, but it neglects to acknowledge the true need of Guam's elders and the criteria differences among that continuum. There's one nursing home on Guam which serves as a catch-all for that continuum of care. This means that residents um, th that we could admit are anywhere from high functioning to total care, bed bound, and down to the level of hospice. This is unheard of in the mainland because of the criteria for each of the settings. St. Dominic's, um, at St. Dominic's, we are expected to meet the needs of the entire Manumco population because there's no other option. This demographic of elderly on Guam is not only rising, um, but the acuity of these elders is in rapid decline in comparison to 30 years ago. St. Dominic's was designed to serve the Manumco with the intent that they could still participate in some level of care, meaning they can do ADLs, IADLs. Residents were ambulatory, they were walking around. They were far less sickly in comparison to the residents that we're seeing now. St. Dominic's used, uh, used to see more referrals from the community or adult day settings. Now, the majority, or 92% of our referrals this year have come from the hospitals, including Maine GMH, GMH is SNU, Naval Hospital, and GRMC. These patients cannot be appropriately discharged home because they require 24 seven nursing care and supervision. Identify concerns with this bill. Simply changing the terminology nursing home to assisted living does not solve our care crisis on island for Armanumco. It does not call, um, solve the caregiver shortage we're also seeing and the number of families unfit or who refuse to care for their elders. The hospitals are at capacity and the only long-term care facility, which is St. Dominic's, equipped to handle the level of care required for these patients, we can't admit them. Elders either do not have enough savings for long-term care or MIP won't approve them for either financial or medical criteria. For financial, MIP caps income at approximately $1,000 per month, meaning any applications we get over that threshold will not qualify. St. Dominic's has had over eight applications denied for MIP for that reason this year. The medical requirement for MIP targets bedbound patients and those with limited mobility um, in their ability to participate with ADLs. MIP needs to change and expand coverage to custodial care. SNU, GRMC, and GMH all have um, applicants that were denied by MIP. Assisted living and nursing homes are two different categories of regulation and law. Guam needs to implement laws over the continuum of care based on the criteria at each level. 
In terms of acuity, the world is facing a generational care crisis due to the number of aging baby boomers, and Guam is no exception. Baby boomers are not only less financially capable of affording long-term care options, but as a generation, like I said, they're, pre they're sicker than the previous. St. Dominic's currently has 35 residents who all require nursing level care and are not appropriate for assisted living. Um, if you look at the care categories I've laid out here, we have red, which are high risk, meaning they're ostomy, catheters, feeding tubes, bed bound, total care. They cannot participate in transfers, high risk. 18 of our residents out of the 35 are categorized as red. Yellow are moderate risks, which are also risk for falls, controlled diabetics, and they can tolerate a wheelchair, but not more than two hours. And they also require transfer um, assistance for transfers. Greens are our lowest risk for fall, minimal behavior concerns, and generally stable health care condition, can tolerate extended periods of time in a wheelchair, and can participate in transfers. 95% of St. Dominic's applicants in 2022 would be categorized as red. In comparison to 10 years ago, where the majority would have been yellow or green. To summarize, it is dangerous to widen the scope of regulation in the name of expanding options for assisted living facilities for a few reasons. It will actually narrow the scope of patients that St. Dominic's, which is our only care facility at this time, um, is able to admit um, when there's already a demonstrated need for nursing care. Expansion of MIP coverage to custodial care will provide more patients care options beyond the acute level in a hospital, which is more expensive to keep them at. Guam will not only be able to find qualified personnel and staff or to staff facilities as the field is already strained now and the regulatory standards require nurses and administrators. Assisted livings and nursing homes are not interchangeable. There are different sets of regulations and rules for each of the environments. Guam has already identified a need for nursing homes in order to get decompress the hospitals. It doesn't make sense to replace the level altogether. The solution to the elder care crisis on Guam is to create regulation for the echelons of care and expand financial coverage. Looking at national trends and those on Guam, there are more people being admitted to the later stages of the continuum opposed to being identified early on. In the field, we are triaging newly identified high need patients instead of declining them or um, identifying them years in advance. People are being admitted directly to skilled nursing, which is the highest level of care. Additionally, Unlike Guam, the mainland is pushing for more um, at-home and community-based services, like mentioned previously, to help elders age in place instead of being institutionalized. This requires coordination among providers. Unfortunately, the readmission rate to acute care hospitals is incredibly high. We are already working to streamline care on island. I started bi-weekly meetings with the hospitals and OPG to identify at-risk elders and those eligible for St. Dominic's. Open communication between providers has been influential in progressing our admissions along. It is critical for us in the field to know if our lawmakers comprehend the complexity of the needs of our elders and are willing to create regulations supporting sustainable and affordable options for the Manamco of this island. Thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you very much. Charlene St. Nicholas from the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Hafede, Madam Speaker Chalahi, and esteemed senators of the 36th Guam Legislature, uh, Senator Sabina Perez, Senator Joanne Brown, and Senator Tello Taidui. I am Charlene St. Nicholas, Senior Citizens Administrator, and on behalf of Director Arthur U. St. Augustine, I provide the following testimony. The Department of Public Health and Social Services along with the Division of Senior Citizens, submits the, this testimony on Bill number 341-36, introduced by yourself, Speaker Terlahi, Senator Sabina Flores, Paris, and Tello Taidegui, an act to amend Chapter 7 of Division 1, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, and add a new N to subsection 9302-B1 of Chapter 9 of Division 1, Title 26, Guam Administrative Rules, and regulations relative to expanding options for assisted living facilities. On May 24, 2022, the Division of Senior Citizens received email communication from our grantor Administration for Community Living under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Region 9, informing the division, assisted living has a separate licensing division outside of the Department of Aging to oversee the assisted living facilities. 
States have various, uh, varying funding from Medicaid, all based on a waiver, um, CN close. Additionally, information received from the Division of Public Health from its research on assisted living reports that majority of the states evaluated did not place assisted living facilities under the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Therefore, we believe this bill will require further research and input from our federal partners before it's finalized. Further, the Division of Senior Citizens will continue to advocate and partner with the Medicaid program to participate in waivers to support assisted living for Guam. Bill 341, Section 3, Funding Support for Assisted Living Facility states, within 180 calendar days of enactment of this law, the DPHSS shall submit to the legislature recommendations of maximizing funding support and the operation of assisted living facilities. This language should be made clearer. Is this section requiring DPHSS to identify and apply for federal grants? Or is this section requiring DPHSS to propose how we can support the operations of assisted living facilities? Our current appropriations, which will be an added cost not factored into the FY, current FY23 budget, or will DPHSS submit a request for supplemental funding? Lastly, our department notes that the legislature has delegated rulemaking authority to DPHSS, which has not been altered or revoked by law. The formal rulemaking process can be initiated to perfect the, this amendment sought in the bill. This will ensure the rule will survive possible challenges to its validity. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to begin then. And um, of course, thank all of you for your testimony. Mr. Camacho, did you want to testify or not right now? OK. All right. OK, thank you. Appreciate that. All right, well, I appreciate all the testimony. And, and I want to state straight out, uh, it took me a long time reading your testimonies this morning to figure out, you know, what was um, the objection. And now I think I understand based on all of the testimonies together. And I think, so first of all, the intent of the bill was to expand the terminology used on Guam in our law so that the entire continuum of care would be regulated by public health. And, and um, I was hoping that the public health uh, MIP and Medicaid division would also be here because I think they're critical to this discussion. And what we wanted to do was expand uh, what they could license uh, in addition to nursing homes and skilled nursing homes or skilled uh, living facilities to uh, expand it for the entire, um, for every level that they saw fit. So that was the intent. But I, I think by using the term assisted living, it's, it's all of your consensus that we have used a term of art that narrows this scope as opposed to, it was okay. But so I think I understand that and, and thank you for pointing that out and I'm going to do my best to fix this. It is intended to be a broad term that all you know types of living, facilities that can be licensed and perhaps can be covered by Medicaid, perhaps can be covered by HUD, that type of thing, that, that public health would be able to license on Guam all of those at the different levels. Not at all to detract from the current work that's going on, in fact, to expand it. We know that you are in critical need of nurses, of doctors, and of space, and just that we are aware, I am aware, that many patients are turned away. They don't meet the criteria. And the other intent was that by adding this term to MIP, what I did in the bill was to hopefully get MIP to cover without exception any type of um, senior care required, you know, along this continuum of care. That was the intention. And so I can see now that, yeah, we need to change the terms. If we are going to be consistent with HUD, we're going to be consistent with the terms that uh, are used uh, in other places. But that is the intention, is to allow public health this wide range 
and actually to expand the MIP coverage. So both um, the public guardian's testimony and uh, uh, St. Dominic's testimony were very specific that MIP law right now prohibits custodial care and we need to remove that. So thank you very much for this very specifics. And then the income limits. The income limits I was not intending to address. I was hoping uh, that public health would, I guess, are you here from public health? Okay, I'm gonna stop. Let's hear from public health before I go any further. Would you like to testify? Okay, sure, yes, appreciate that. Okay, could you just state your name for the record? Just, what, let's do it again with the mic on. Uh, acting uh, Division Head of uh, Public Welfare, which could oversees you, the Could you state your name again? Carlos B. Pangolinan. Okay. Acting Division Head of the uh, Division of Public Welfare at uh, Public Health. Okay, great. That's, yeah, exactly who I wanted. Okay, great. So. What we're discussing is that the intent of the bill was to expand uh, public health's ability to regulate different types of um, care and uh, not at all to narrow it. And, but it's, we, we recognize we have nursing care, and we, but we want you to be able to regulate all of them and hopefully to cover more of them, right? And so that is really the key, and that's what we're trying to do. And uh, it's been pointed out by the public guardian and by St. Dominic's is more in their testimony that um, there's a provision in the MIP statute that I, I missed that says custodial care is not allowed by MIP. I was trying to include all types of this care under the MIP, and so they say we need to address that term custodial care not allowed, and that we also may want to look at the caps that MIP is currently using, and then the um, ambulatory medical designation that medic, um, MIP also limits, right? So our goal was to increase coverage, right? Yes. Can you turn your mic on? Thank you. Yeah, understood. Uh, we do cover, um, I guess St. Dominic's services under a uh, what's referred to as an ICF level care. Um, we do not cover, uh, I don't think there is a provision for custodial care at the moment, um, but from mm. the Medicaid side, uh, just to let you know that our director has been very um, uh, energetic about trying to assist with assisted living and we have begun discussions with our federal stakeholders regarding that. Uh, states uh, do uh, state programs for Medicaid do cover this type of service. Yes, uh, we do have a home care uh, type service that we already cover, but it seems like this is a little bit more. Um, how should I say expansive? Um, but what I can say is that we are we, we we did make the request and we did we have we are looking at different programs uh, across the country, uh, which Charlene has shared with us and we have engaged in that discussion. So what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have to uh, eventually create some kind of a uh, state plan amendment for Medicaid to cover uh, those services. But we, st we do need to work out what exactly it is that we're asking for. Okay, great. And so yeah, the, in response to your question, what type of funding are we asking you to go seek? That's exactly what we are hoping you're going to do. It's like, tell us what in Medicaid we can control, not control, to get this continuum of care coverage covered. Right. And what in MIP, of course, um, we, you recommend that we, we change. Do you the, think we have an issue with the MIP income limits? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I've not really looked into the eligibility requirements for MIP. I'm sorry. I, I just learned about the. Well, I, I was just asked to come to the hearing today. Uh, but what I can say, um, at least for the Medicaid side, the only concern that we might have regarding um, because the bill is kind of geared toward a specific population, um, and uh, what our our uh, partners have been uh, kind of stressing to us is 
focus on the type of service you want. Do not try, try not to focus on the kind of people that you're trying to serve because Medicaid is really, you know, for Medicaid clients and they make no distinction between disabled or uh, aged and stuff like that. Okay. All right, so yeah, that was based on a suggestion by uh, St. Dominic's and also the public guardian that um, the caps should be raised because mm -hmm. the people are being disqualified or ineligible. The other, for St. Dominic's in particular, the other one is that um, the medical restrictions, ambulatory versus not ambulatory, mm -hmm. should, we should also look at that. And then, um, and then we got testimony from public health that says that they are able to make these cha changes by their rules and regulations. Of course, this bill is proposing a change to a rule that's already published. Uh, and I wanna know, are there rules that you are, if you are able to make these changes to accommodate more of the seniors currently, are, are you looking at that? Are you able to do that? Is there no need for this bill because you're going to do that or are we not working on that right now? That's sometimes why these bills get introduced. Uh, so for that comment, uh, Speaker, uh, I know that our department is looking at uh, the regulations that's stated uh, in the bill. Of course, um, as also Kate's brought up, it's been um, so many years, so we do need to make sure that it is updated um, as well in, in the regula regulation site. So, and it won't just be one specific um, division, it'll be a team of divisions. So we also have our other areas, our, our public health, um, our division, senior citizens, and of course, public welfare and environmental health. So I, I know that this will be something we will be doing uh, within the department and we will provide you um, okay. updates. All right, great. So the bill is intended to, to spur that activity and that public health will review their rules and regs because now we are requiring that they can license the, you know, a, a spectrum of um, needs. But uh, yeah as opposed to where the bill does not dictate what your regulations are going to be, nor does it dictate, you know, what um, requirements you will allow, nor does it dictate the change to the plan, but it urges that for sure by, by allowing public health to cover all of those. All right, and then, um, let me just see. So I just wanted to make sure I'm, sh I'm correct Kate, when you said that this will actually narrow the scope of patients, St. Dominic's is able to admit when there's already a demonstrated need for nursing care. We're not intending at all to narrow the nursing care that's allowed. We were intending to add on to that. So if we change the terms, that, I mean, or, yeah, that's, we want to continue to, re, to allow nursing care. And then you have your other recommendations, of course, which I agree full heartedly with that, you know, we need staff and we will need um, different things from public health in order to do this, but that's what we're hoping to spur here is that. And, um, okay. And, and so I wanna note for the record before I uh, open up for my colleagues that we do have written testimony from Gia Ramos, she's the executive director of a Medicare and Medicaid home health care agency, GVN DBA Guam Visiting Nurses. We also have written testimony from Gida. We have written testimony from the public guardian, Marceline Santos. We have testimony that was read this morning by the Department of Public Health and Social Services with two attachments. We have testimony by St. Dominic's that was also read this morning, and we have the testimony by Gura and with the HUD um, Housing for the Elderly Program documents also attached. So thank you again. So I'm gonna open it up now to my colleagues, Senator Taitigui. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, good, good morning, or almost good afternoon to everyone who's here today. You know, I'm always very excited about this bill because it's, it's just saying that we're moving forward to what the end result was, is that we need more facility, facilities like this on Guam. Um, when I did do some research on this, on the bill that was recently passed uh, for the QC bill for um, investors to come here, um, I 
visited some facilities in Hawaii and um, found that uh, one facility covered everything from independent living uh, to assistant living to nursing and even a dementia section all in one area so that that individual can actually, you know, uh, live their life out in one place instead of being uprooted from one uh, area to another as, as they age, you know, they uh, progressively lose, you know, their, their ability to function um, non-independently. So uh, I think the, the intent was this bill was to provide just a wider perspective so that one facility can have everything in one and uh, be considered um, opportunities in other areas like MIP and Medicaid, et cetera. So um, I, I appreciate too, as well, the comments that were made and to try and strengthen um, what we can do to our, our aging community and providing a place for them. They, they can uh, age in place, you know, or who don't have the ability of having family or uh, to take care of them as they get older or even even if they have children, you know, they don't want to burden their children. They want to be able to, you know, uh, take care of themselves to the very end. Um, independence is very important for most Manumko. I, I know my father's 93 and he gets upset knowing that, you know, we have to help him with something. He doesn't want to lose that independence, you know. So it, it, it becomes kind of difficult. But when you're amongst your, people your own age, you know, and uh, seeing them, they, they all have the... Uh, that same camaraderie and <laughs> they definitely can complain the same complaint, you know, sing the same song, but we need to find a facility here on Guam. We need more facilities. St. Dominic's has been there forever. It's, it's aging. Um, by the way, before I move on, uh, on your testimony, um, Kate, on your paragraph one, two, three, uh, paragraph three, where it begins the language we use to describe care levels is critical because in, you know, et cetera. Further down, it's the second to the last sentence. Did you mean to put, is there no other option? I uh, just wanted to clarify that because it says, Dominic's, uh, we are expected to meet the needs of the entire Manumka population because there is, should be no there, other option? Uh, yes. That there are no other options. Okay, it wasn't mm -hmm. in there, and I just wanted to make sure, you know, if uh, to be to be clear, yeah, there is no other option. It's very difficult on this island, and um, I commend St. Dominic's for all the all the years they've been here taking care of our Manapco. But unfortunately, you know, there's not enough room to cover uh, those who are aging, as as you may know, in doing studies that by the year 2034, and Guam is no exception, there'll be more. Uh, individuals over the age of 65 than there are children. So it's, it's a different need uh, that needs to arrive. By the way, how much does uh, St. Dominic's receive from public health annually to cover those who are um, at St. Dominic's now? So currently, um, MIP, our reimbursement is $190 per a day, which if you actually look at the national averages for nursing homes, that number is $324 per day. So it is severely underfunded. Um, additionally, the, the setting that you talked about seeing in Hawaii, um, that's called the CCRC, and those are great. I actually did my preceptorship at a CCRC. They're amazing in theory, um, and this is just my, my personal opinion having worked in the field. I don't know if that would work here, primarily because a CCRC includes independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skills. What happens in a CCRC from a financial standpoint is they make more um, independent living apartments with the intention that those people will eventually decline. Independent living residents are, it's like a cash cow, you know? You make a lot of money on those residents because they don't need um, a high care level. Um, and they're still paying quite a bit of money to be in an inclusive, safe environment, to be among their elders, for their families to know that they're protected. The problem with the CCRC, and why I'm not sure it would work here, is CCRCs almost exclusively are private pay. So what happens is the nursing centers, or skilled nursing, is always in the red. They're prepared to lose. And the way that um, CCRCs stay afloat is that um, independent living section. 
The problem with that here is we're already seeing there aren't enough wealthy, independent living um, residents that would be able to afford to sustain that lower level. Um, additionally, in a CCRC, you have two different administrators. So independent living is not run by an administrator, but it happens to be under the same umbrella. When you go to then assisted living, that's a separate administrator. Under um, NCAL, I actually referenced that, under a separate, um, a separate set of regs. Then you have the nursing center where Medicaid typically is used, where you can have Medicare and Medicaid beds. So skilled nursing unit up in Barragata Heights has both Medicare and Medicaid beds, according to their recent surveys. The problem is Medicaid beds can only be in skilled nursing. They cannot be in assisted living. So as it was mentioned, we are talking about in assisted living that we could have um, you know, some Medicaid support, which is great, but there's not Medicaid beds, which Medicaid, since they're not covering that bed cost, the bed cost is the most expensive thing, you know, $6,000 depending uh, per month, depending on that level. So as great as the CCRC sounds in theory, uh, the execution of it, I mean, St. Dominic's already is doing that, right? Like we have that continuum of care. I don't admit greens. I don't admit people that are at that independent living level, mostly because they don't exist, and why would they want to be at St. Dominic's? So when I admit someone, they're far further down the tiers. They're toward the end of like an ALF criteria heading towards skilled nursing, or they're already a skilled nursing criteria. So again, how much annually do you receive in just med uh, MIP funding? Just MIP, because MIP comes from the general fund. Mm, I'd have to look that specific I, I number that up for you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. It's about 1.8 Carlos. million. I'm sorry? About 1.8 million. 1.8 million. Oh, I thought yeah, it was around 2 million, but 40. it's 1.8 million yeah. from MIP uh, for those individuals. You know, I, I hear what you're talking about, um, but, you know, it, if, if that was such an issue, then I don't know why they have at least four other facilities. I mean, they built one in Waikiki, and then they built one in, uh, up across the Pali Highway, and then they built two more facilities, all having that same concept of, you know, living in place. I understand the, you know, independent, why would they go and stay in a place like that? Well, many of them prefer, you know, being amongst other people and uh, their own age group or, uh, you know, finding that company because many of them live alone and by themselves in their homes. And, uh, you know, it's healthier to have that social perspective and, and being in, you know, other complexes like that that uh, provide that, you know, uh, social gathering perspective. But um, the facility I saw was quite impressive. I mean, from downstairs was the independent living, individual seniors, you know, and then up second floor was assistant, third floor was nursing. So, um, I mean, if something like that is working so well, my, my only concern is that you're absolutely right with the demographics on who can afford some type of uh, facility such as like that, and that's where Guam comes in. And I think Korea has, uh, I'm, I'm hearing they have an excellent, uh, senior uh, facility, living facility for their, their aging population and, uh, and it, it, even for those who can't afford it, you know, that they're being taken care of. So that's something I th I'm looking into as well and seeing what Korea is doing to address their aging population. But I, I truly agree that uh, we need to amend uh, the, this bill to make sure we accommodate all perspectives from you know, not, not just categorize it to one. So I appreciate those comments. Thank you everyone who testified and appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We also have um, Mr. Michael Gallo from Department of Public Health. Did you wanna also add to the testimony? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, Senator Brown. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the, the dialogue, and I'm, I'm very happy that we're further pursuing this issue with Senator Tello's bill and certainly your bill, Madam Speaker, to address what obviously we're seeing is a growing need in our community. When I was growing up, it would be unheard of that my grandparent, and I only had one because my grandfather is the only one who uh, survived uh, from the war on to live to about the age of 83, but it would have been unimaginable 
in my house and in my family that he would live anywhere else except in his home until he passed away. Um, that is not the case anymore. We have a lot of elderly in our community and even though you have children and you may have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's no guarantee that the child or, you know, when they grow up and they have other families, other obligations and responsibilities that they're going to be there or they don't live on Guam. Many of them do not live on Guam. And so obviously we do have a growing um, need of, of elder members in our community that do need the support. Some, you know, are, are still active enough that they can get about on their own. They might not be able to drive anymore, but in terms of their own living environment, they're able to take care of themselves. Majority, unfortunately, uh, need assistance or because of health are in decline. And so certainly anything we can do to help facilitate this for our community is very important because we'd hate the thought that we have elder members of our community that are not receiving the kind of care uh, and living in, in decent facilities that we would want them uh, to live in. I did want to ask, I mean, we're seeing the, the population, and, and you know, many years ago when Menengen was built, I was at Guam EPA at the time, but the focus back then uh, for the investors that uh, built that facility, that was one of the agenda, that was one of the biggest clientele they were looking at, is actually building that for elder members of the Japanese community to live on Guam, to fly here and live on Guam. Uh, that never quite materialized at the time, but that was what, that's, God, that's 30 something years ago. Um, but I wanted to get some feedback, I don't know, um, if, if uh, Gura or even uh, Mr. Camacho, because I know you've definitely been very active in helping provide uh, needed housing on this community. Um, how do you see that trend and what, what would we anticipate we would need maybe in the next five to 10 years to accommodate uh, this need in our community? And then also the bigger question obviously is the ability to pay for it. Uh, you know, because wow, 300 something a day, that's, that's a lot. And I assume those are, those are maybe uh, elderly members that I guess might need more than just, uh, you know, care of, of feeding, clothing. I mean, literally, I assume they might have other medical needs that would require uh, that amount. I mean, most people just don't make that kind of money. So it's like, what, uh, what, what do you anticipate in the next five to 10 years here in our local community for this, this need? for this type of housing and, and facilities that would provide this other type of assisted uh, support. Uh, thank you, Senator. Well, in terms of figures, well, we can go back and analyze, analyze that. I, I can tell you what we do see. So Gura, in terms of its public housing, as well as some of the vouchers that we put out that are specific uh, to certain uh, populations, um, provide for elderly housing and housing for the non-elderly disabled. However, what GURA provides is specific to the very low to low income range. And additionally, the requirement is that they have to be able to live independently. We do see kind of a transition sometimes and we get calls um, from, from individuals within our housing units and we do our best to facilitate services for them. And, you know, some of those that have um, some of our social work capability within the agency, we put towards that with some of the programs that we have. Um, we will see somebody who was independent living and maybe because of a medical procedure or a surgery, they need some daily assistance, right? Or, you know, we see that transition happening in some of our housing units. Um, and for as long as we can, we try to keep them in that, in that level. We even allow for a caregiver to be assigned to that resident as well. And that, that happens in some of the cases. That way we can retain the individual in terms of housing for, for a while. However, there does come a point when they've aged to the point or the, the services that are required. Um, one creates a big liability for the agency and also because it's not consistent with um, the HUD requirements in terms of who can be in those housing units, right? Um, if I could go further to a broader recommendation to the legislation is I think you've heard across the spectrum there are, there are different categories and while we use some slightly different terms they're generally based on the services that are required right girl so girl plays a big part in the independent living portion of that right in terms of that income scale that we provide for um, however I think if we consider in the legislation not necessarily broader terms and not even very specific terms but based on at least generally what, what I've seen with HUD and, and even with uh, the spectrum of care, is, is typically about four categories, right? Closest end of the spectrum, independent. Uh, furthest end is, is full care, right? Skilled nursing, nursing home. And then in between, there's you know, two, arguably three categories in that, right? Um, 
administratively you could consider that this would be a benefit to everybody including including public health I'm not speaking on public health but speaking from my administrative background that the rules promulgated and the licenses proposed would be developed based on the services provided as opposed to you know throwing them a buffet and saying figure out how to sort it this would also allow us to kind of put into focus the requirements of the stakeholders potential opportunities that we can you know request from hud to provide insight on and feedback so that as these rules get promulgated depending on the greatest need right we can front load that that we could potentially get some of these programs going right and that as private investors are looking at it either through the qualifying certificate or hud programs or you know, not just investors but even nonprofit organizations they're looking at it within within um within the scope that's going to be appropriate to the licensing as well as the services that's provided right and then also things that are offered by by the government in terms of assisting those um and you know and and, and i do want to apologize that it wasn't until this bill came up, apart that I, I i took a deep dive in this right because again these programs under hood are not generally administered by Gura, right? We don't have a specialist in here. The closest specialists for these multifamilies programs are in San Francisco. However, we have reached to them. So getting the, the discussion started and working on the categories that have been presented and getting, I guess, and figuring out how more defined, but not overly defined, the legislation can place those categories and allow public health to promulgate rules and, and licensing requirements based on the individual categories, right? And then we can start working on those. Because, you know, even on our end, MIP requires income thresholds. Our different programs, HUD offers, require different income thresholds, right? And trying to align those and working together instead of, again, trying to figure it out at the buffet versus, you know, figuring out by the water cooler, you know, we can focus in and get these programs out a little sooner. So I know that's a little bit more than you asked, but I just wanted no, to take the I, opportunity I, I appreciate that to kind I, of yeah. provide a recommendation of how we can move this on. Yeah. And, and just follow up with your statement, what happens to an individual that, that can no longer, you know, be independent, take care of themselves? And yet they're under your housing program. Where, where do they go? Do you know? Because I mean that, I mean we understand St. Dominic certainly for many years has been providing assistance, but obviously, all care is going to re require somebody's got to pay for it. Someone's got to provide it. Someone has to pay for it. What happens to those individuals? I really think there's a lot of elderly in our community. They're, they're sight unseen, uh, that may need that assistance. That may not be living in a quality of life uh, because they don't have the support system around them. We just don't see them, you know, they're just not visible to us. They might be living in their own, their own home, but, but struggling because they don't have that. So what, what happens in that case, if you have an individual, they may be living a number of years in your housing and then health, whatever reason, they're no longer able to care for themselves. As you mentioned, you can give assistance to a certain level. Yeah, then again, absolutely. Um, some so of our service happens? coordinators, Senator, will we'll kind of work with them to coordinate services oftentimes from mm -hmm. nonprofits, public health, mm -hmm. um, to try to provide assistance to them. Um, what we see then is kind of a cycle in and out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if they don't have, you know, they're not in the best care or don't have the financial means or there aren't other opportunities, um, you know, they're just going to keep going back and forth and, you know, oftentimes, you know, may not last. But, but, we also see that at that point when they progress, some family members will come and, and take them to be with them. Um, other times, in, in some instances, we'll see a family member, you know, become the caregiver as well. So really what we try to do is keep them in a way that, you know, keep them as long as possible, as long as we're in, in conformance with the rules and regulations, right? But we, we try to avoid as much as possible saying, you know, to, to kick them kick them out right and that's that's the last thing we want to avoid absolutely mm -hmm. so but it is a it is a difficult situation and um at least for our public housing our ross coordinator you know they have their hands full so we have one that that's paid for that basically kind of responds to all in uh the entirety of our public housing um in terms of our aging as well our elderly as well as not elderly disabled populations but uh, w I think the, the agency does a very good job and the different amps in understanding their residents, understanding their situations and trying to um, provide for and coordinate for services as much as possible. But 
you know, again, the services are only being required more often and the capabilities overall are not increasing. So um, there, there definitely is a projected difficulty there in the future. I, I appreciate the response. I wanted to ask, I know Mr. Camacho, I, your, your background obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you've really done a lot of work to, to contribute to the needs in our community, especially for housing especially for low-income housing. And I just want to get your, your input as well. I mean, we see the demand, but to what degree and, and, and what degree of interest is out there to pursue uh, constructing the, these type of facilities on our island? Because, you know, I've always found it strange. You work your whole life in one place, and then because um, a lot of older people don't have the infrastructure, or maybe their children are no longer an island, or their grandchildren, then they reach a certain age, and then they, they leave Guam. Some of them, I know, don't necessarily want to leave their home, but because this is what they know, their friends are here, their life has been here, but because they don't have that support, sometimes they, they end up leaving. I mean, they're in their 70s, their 80s, uh, and that's not necessarily desired. I mean, I, I think if they could get that support system here, they, like I would, I would want to stay here. You know, I want to stay and die here on Guam. But I just want to get your input with your expertise and your background with the legislation that's been passed and a legislation like this that's before us today that, that we're reviewing. Uh, what do you see the viability and interest of it uh, to, to build these type of facilities here on Guam so they're accessible for our people. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Good morning, Senator. My name is Carlos Camacho. I'm with Micronesia Community Development Corporation, one of the other hats I wear. Uh, and that's the one that focuses on uh, affordable housing. So um, I did participate in the original legislation that Senator Tello and you, the, the Senate here, passed maybe several months ago, I think, uh, for the senior program. And when I participated, I, I, I wanted to give a little genesis where I came from from that point. The thought behind the bill was exactly what all these guys described. Every program they just described are sometimes income driven. And I remember when, uh, when one of the, the, the questions was, why did we use the word terminology, the keyword, 80% area median income up to 115% area median income? And the reason we use those ver variables is each of these income limits are tied to what you just got received today, some from HUD. And I know I didn't see my other federal partner here, USDA and public health that has those. Everybody has different income limits and targeted demographics. For whichever uh, developer or nonprofit would like to use these resources and to make sure it's avail it avails to these targeted market. So that's why when you guys originally passed the first law, we try to make it uh, very uh, flexible so that it, it, it targets those market. And the reason we went up to uh, 115, exactly what that uh, lady said from uh, the nursing home, that sometimes just under just the nursing home itself, uh, under the budget that they receive, it can't be so su sufficient. That's why you need sometimes the independent living side of the equation, which is the cash flow side, to help offset some of the stuff. But you know, I know she's saying she's not seeing that because no one has truly developed a independent living uh, model. But with the resources that you guys provided, and I'm not sure which developer would be because my focus is only on uh, housing, not yet to the elderly, but on the other type of housing. And that's why today I'm just doing my due diligence, listening to the needs and the wants uh, I, I already know what federal resources are available. I already know what the targeted demographics are. And I'll speak to one of the programs that we use successfully in Gura. Since Gura mentioned one of their success, uh, some of the programs they've, they've uh, administered. One of them is called the Low Income Housing Tax Credits. Now you guys remember, this is the same body that fixed the infamous Lada Estates. LADA was a project done by three different terms, never was successful. Finally, we, this legislative body 
made an amendment so low-income housing tax credits can be used. Look at today. Today there is a mix of senior housing administered by Gura. There's a mix of low-income housing, and that's a diverse mix of independent living. There's no assisted living there yet because they have an agent to where they're at, but it finally got a product that was used to be 20 years of not doing anything to, to infusion of housing opportunities for those two markets. And the reason I say that is everybody's right here today. Everybody's saying the right things. That's why I, wa I didn't want to say because I wanted to, to listen on, on uh, uh, where everybody's at. And I'm glad there are the, the speaker and you guys are looking at uh, diversifying the uh, Medicare and uh, Medicaid. So that targeted uh, income group can have access if budget allows. So at least that can also help offset some cash flow. Whoever is going to build a diverse uh, community. So already we know we could uh, we could utilize Section 202, like Mr. Former Senator Stevens mentioned from HUD, right? And nobody has applied in that yet. And um, he did fully disclose HUD announced there's 174 million nationally to apply for. That doesn't mean that's all for Guam, but nationally. But so far, nobody for this region and Region 9 has applied, so we, we may have a little edged into that. Then you got the low income housing tax credit that's done annually. That's 30, 40 million dollars a year. That again is controlled uh, by the IRS, but Gura can dictate, says, for this year we can focus on elderly housing. Or this year, and they do that, it's called through the Qualified Action Plan. They can say this year we want to focus 80% of that portfolio to senior housing or vice versa and this and that. And that's up to them depending on their needs assessment and all that. But, um, or when we submit a, what we call a market study. And that's why I'm doing my due diligence and trying to understand the market. And you guys are providing the right, the right tools available out there. Now would that, that entice developers? That's why I'm here to listen. And yes, we are aging to that, to answer that question. We are going, there's no way we're gonna go backwards, we're going forward. I'm finally, met my senior years right now, I'm already at 57. <laughs> So I'm already up there, but uh, we're, we're, we're coming up there with, with uh, as Senator Tello said, statistically, uh, we're, we're gonna be outpacing the younger generations. <laughs> so we're just, we're just prepping the uh, foundation and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, there's many, many programs out there. There's some senior programs that I do for those who don't wanna go on and live in, uh, uh, in their own. It's called Section 5, uh, I'm, I'll fully disclose it, Section 504 under USDA. It's a ADA uh, rehabilitation grant. I've helped a lot of elderly lay, uh, families modify their home because when they were home originally, their home was not ADA compliant. The front door, the sidewalks, the kitchen wasn't built. So USDA has under Section 504 an ADA grant, combination of grant and loan, to modify the bathroom, modify the kitchen, and they enter the door, if for those guys they just still wanna live at their home. I've done a, a bunch of them there uh, with that already, and um, that's for those who doesn't want to live outside of the home. But what your bill, what you guys done in this legislation is allow for those that don't have those real estate assets and may wanna live in a environment in that case. I hope that answers your question, but well, I, I- I certainly appreciate your, your insight because I know your expertise. I mean, I jokingly- I'm still learning, I, still learning yeah. on the senior side. <laughs> well, but I, I think making the connection with the legislation and the federal resources and other resources that are available are gonna be very helpful, especially, I mean, if we don't pursue it, there's that disconnect, you know? And I, I have yeah. to tell you, I jokingly, just brought to mind, I jokingly tell my son, he's very young right now, but I, I jokingly tell him, please don't put mommy in a shipping container in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> don't take over the main house and move me out in the backyard, jokingly. I'm just planting those seeds uh, early. Uh, so. but, but, it, but, but it is true. I, 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 I think you or one of the senators mentioned, 
Yes, we do have in our culture, sometimes there's eight, nine of us. Mm -hmm. And I remember several months ago when you guys were doing the first legislation mm -hmm. and the senator did mention it in her uh, public testimony, Senator Tello, uh, it was a group out of Minnesota, I think, that came to Guam to uh, hire caregivers. Yes, yes. Not, nur they, not, not nursing, caregivers yeah. mm -hmm. to promote their independent living or whatever, you know, in that case. So they also seeing a need over there then try to take, and w w when I asked the manager, he goes, now what, what makes you come over to come to this part of the world? He goes, it's you guys culture. It's that culture. It's that, that, you know, they, they, they take care of their families and that's what we're looking for. So if we already have that basic foundation, I think we're, 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 we're there. We're just now, you guys are providing the right tools for someone to keep us home, right. keep our seniors here, and uh, hopefully uh, our culture and everybody to help our families. Well, and also, here. like you said, I mean, but anyway, we provide, provide employment opportunities for our own people. They don't have to go all the way to Minnesota to, to work. I mean, they, yeah. can, they can contribute right here and still be at home. So thank you, Mr. Camacho. You guys are I all, you, all you senators are doing the right uh Right things, and we're making all the correct adjustments as needed. <laughs> Thank well, you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to come today, and hopefully, Madam Speaker, I, I'm very supportive of this. I hope you'll consider me as your co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Paris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to thank everybody who came out here to give their testimony. It's very valuable. We'll definitely bring in, uh, definitely use that to amend the bill. And again, the um, intent of the bill was to really expand the continuum of care, which we desperately need on this island. And uh, just looking at you, uh, all of you here, I think it, you, know, you, know, you have all the pieces of the puzzle, I think, to help uh, really push forward this development uh, to, to get towards this continuum of care that we need here on island. Um, if I could just ask a question about um, you know, HUD uh, in regards to liability. So what are the restrictions for liability as well as um, uh, eligibility? So uh, one of the things like you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, uh, a person that's living in Gura may become in, incapacitated and may have to uh, phase out of, of Gura for whatever reason, right? But what if a family member, is there options for family members to come in? Uh, is there perhaps a waiver of eligibility uh, as far as, um, you know, income level so that they can provide the needed service for their um, family member? Um. Generally, yes. I, I did mention that earlier, you know, with my statement to that um, we get families that can live in, be um, live in aid, uh, not necessarily a caregiver. Um, I don't believe, I'll get clarification and send that to the committee. Off the top of my head, I don't believe in that situation their income is considered, right, if they're kind of a live in aid. But it really does depend on the the situation of the person, right? If it's a family member, it, it, it makes a difference whether, let's say it's a family member or um, an aide or caregiver that's going to come for a couple of hours a day and assist with some services uh, versus somebody living there, right? So we have to look at the individual situation independently and ask, you know, the questions required and, and then make the determination based on, on the rules, uh, based on the situation. I, I know that doesn't really help. But we do look at it on a case-by-case -case basis um, to, to make the determination because all of those details matter. I hope, I hope that answers a little bit at least. But yes, we do provide opportunities for, for um, others to, to assist with the person there. And, and again, to my original statement, we do as much as we can so we don't leave any of our uh, aging uh, populations without, without a home. And what about liability? You mentioned liability. Yeah, so you, you consider, right, like everything uh, what Gura has is ADA, but a lot of those requirements change with age and depending on the disability, right? Because you can go from it as an independent elderly, um, elderly person living independently, right? But depending, and you can be without disabilities, you can just be elderly. But as an aged person starts to develop those disabilities, there might have to be considerations for um, ADA um, uh, changes, right, uh, relative to do it. As an example, with Guma Tranquilidad, we went ahead and made investments to make them all um, uh, additionally accessible, 
right, for the aging populations. But that doesn't mean we can do it for every single GURA unit that, that we have out there, right? So the disability often will dictate kind of what is, what is needed. So, um, so that's one of the liabilities, right? And that's why we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because we have to make sure that the individual is going to be safe in the property as well, right? Yeah. Thank you. Definitely we'll have that more of a like, conversation with all of you uh, offline regarding uh, hopefully ad addressing the, the issue, uh, some of the concerns of the bill. Um, I guess the other thing, too, is, you know, I think the importance of this bill is, you know, we're, we're expanding options. I think that was the point is we wanted to expand options as well as regulate because once we start expanding options, we need to have uh, regulations in place, uh, which is really critical, especially for this population. So um, I think those were the intent, and we'll definitely address a lot of those issues. Um, okay, um, in regards to independent living, so Kate, you were mentioning the CCRC and how independent living is the one that kind of uh, um, subsidizes the other parts. Uh, are, are you familiar if there's any grants out there that can help support that part in the case? So... Typically in um, independent living, it might vary state to state, and Guam is a very um, unique environment, so there may be something out there that would draw, you know, an investor to come here. I actually went to a conference in July where an investor, I was telling him about being here, um, and the idea of taking an existing place, you know, there's like Leo Palace that has a lot of vacancies. Could we turn that into an assisted living or um, an independent living? Engage the interest and actually see how many people want to. In terms of grants, I don't have a solid answer for you on that, um, but it, it's something worth looking into. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And then for, um, I guess, Department of Public Health, you know, administratively, this is a, it's going to add, a, you know, more work, but I think it's really critical. Uh, what kind of resources do you need to 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 uh, accomplish this? If we may, I know we are going to bring back to other director. We did speak about this. Um, thank you for bringing that up, um, Senator Paris, because you're correct. It will take up more resources in terms of identifying the, the team to strengthen, review the regulations, also checking and researching on the Medicaid MIP. It's not, it's not an easy task. Uh, uh, we we want to make sure that you know we do as much as we can. So we do know it's going to take uh, personnel, and um, as you've also stated, it it. it you know, um, that's going to be needed, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you again. Um, I really appreciate you, all of your taking the time to be here this morning and your testimony and, of course, your expertise, so, and that you, um, I think we all have the same goal. We want to ensure that our seniors are well cared for. Those are in dire need. Those are... Um, the ones that are currently being taken care of at St. Dominic's. And I want to thank you uh, in particular. I want to recognize we have with us today Sister Ursula. Thank you, Sister, for being here today and for all your work over all these years and Tess Mandapat and the rest of St. Dominic's staff to thank them for us, please. And, um, and of course, public health, because I know we put a lot of mandates on you and uh, this Medicaid, though, I think we have a unique opportunity, right, if we can, to expand it in any way we can, and where we can't, then to cover with MIP what we find critical needs in our, communi our community. And so we hope we will do that. And uh, again, thank you uh, for the testimony from the two experts over here on HUD and, and federal um, facilities building and management, and I very much appreciate it. So hopefully we will be looking forward to additional testimony from Public Health regarding um, its plans to amend the state plan to cover assisted living and other options. Uh, the um, existing coverage by, you know, of home care and, and others, and, and, and then your thoughts on what has been suggested, and that is to amend the MIP caps for um, elderly or, or everyone, I think, but we're particularly talking about the elderly. That's MIP, not Medicaid. And then the, um, uh, we need to take a, a look closely at the medical restrictions that are currently under the MIP for this type of care and, and see if 
there is an easy way to amend that, that that would include who we think we need to include versus those who are fully capable of caring for themselves. And, um, and of course, if there are rules that can be changed immediately to accommodate more of the needs of our seniors, that, that that be addressed as soon as possible. And we're willing to assist with that in any way. So again, thank you all. Masi for your testimony. There being no further testimony, this hearing is adjourned. It is 11.25 a.m. Sitsu Masi.